Hi there, and welcome to the concluding episode of the History of Silk on Centurions, where we feature man-made things that have lasted 100 years or more. My name is Dimitri. Let's pick up the story. While the Chinese lost their monopoly on silk production, they were able to re-establish themselves as major silk suppliers during the Tang Dynasty and to industrialize their production on a large scale during the Song Dynasty. China continued to export high-quality fabric to Europe and the Near East along the Silk Road. However, following the beginning of the First Crusades, techniques of silk production began to spread across Western Europe. In 1147, while Byzantine Emperor Manuel Komnenos was focusing all his efforts on the Second Crusade, the Norman King Roger II of Sicily attacked Corinth and Thebes, two important centers of Byzantine silk production. They took the crops and silk production infrastructure and deported all the workers to Palermo and Calabria thereby causing the Norman silk industry to flourish. The sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade in 1204 brought decline to the city and its silk industry, and many artisans left the city in the early 13th century. Italy developed a large domestic silk industry after 2,000 skilled weavers came from Constantinople. Many also chose to settle in Avignon to furnish the popes of Avignon. The sudden boom of the silk industry in the Italian state of Lucca, starting in the 11th and 12th centuries, was due to much Sicilian, Jewish and Greek settlement alongside many other immigrants from neighboring cities in southern Italy. With the loss of many Italian trading posts in the Orient, the import of Chinese styles drastically declined. In order to satisfy the demands of the rich and powerful bourgeoisie for luxury fabrics, the cities of Lucca, Genoa, Venice and Florence increased the momentum of their silk production and were soon exporting silk to all of Europe with 84 workshops and at least 7,000 craftsmen in Florence in 1472 alone. In 1519, Emperor Charles V formally recognized the growth of the industry of Catanzaro by allowing the city to establish a consulate of the silk craft charged with regulating and checking the various stages of a production that flourished throughout the 16th century. At the moment of the creation of its guild, the city declared that it had over 500 looms. By 1660, when the town had 16,000 inhabitants, its silk industry kept 1,000 looms and at least 5,000 people in employment. The silk textiles of Catanzaro were not only sold at the Kingdom of Naples markets, they were also exported to Venice, France, Spain and England. The High Middle Ages from 1000 to 1250 AD saw continued use of established techniques for silk manufacture without change in either materials or tools used. Small changes began to appear between the 10th and 12th centuries, followed by larger and more radical innovations in the 13th century, resulting in the invention of new fabrics. Other more mundane fabrics made of hemp and cotton also were developed. 
the 13th century saw an improvement in the already changing technology in silk production, as with the Industrial Revolution of late 18th century England. Advances in silk production also possibly accompanied more general advances in the technology of modern society as a whole. At the beginning of the 13th century, a primitive form of milking silk yarns was in use. Towards the end of the 14th century, no doubt on account of the devastation caused mid-century by the Black Death trends began to shift towards less expensive techniques. Many techniques that earlier in the century would have been completely forbidden by the guilds for low production were now commonplace. For example, using low-quality wool, carding. In the silk industry, the use of water-powered mills grew. In the second half of the 15th century, draw loom technology was first brought to France by an Italian weaver from Calabria, known as Jean Le Calabria, who was invited to Lyon by Louis XI. He introduced a new kind of machine which had the ability to work the yarns faster and more precisely. Further improvements to the loom were made throughout the century. Though highly regarded for its quality, Italian silk cloth was very expensive, both due to the cost of the raw materials and the production process. The craftsmen in Italy proved unable to keep up with the needs of French fashions, which continuously demanded lighter and less expensive materials. Following the example of the wealthy Italian city-states of the era, such as Venice, Florence, and Lucca, which had become the center of the luxury textile industry. Lyon obtained a similar function in the French market. In 1466, King Louis XI decided to develop a national silk industry in Lyon and employed a large number of Italian workers, mainly from Calabria. The fame of the master weavers of Catanzaro spread throughout France and were invited to Lyon in order to teach the techniques of weaving. The draw loom that appeared in those years in France were called Loom by Jean Le Calabre. In the face of protests by the people of Lyon, Louis XI considered to move silk production to Tours but the industry in Tours stayed relatively marginal. His main objective was to reduce France's trade deficit with the Italian states, which caused France to lose 400,000 to 500,000 gold ecos a year. It was under Francis I in around 1535 that a royal charter was granted to two merchants Etienne Touquet and Bartholomew Naris to develop a silk trade in Lyon. In 1540, the king granted a monopoly on silk production to the city of Lyon. Starting in the 16th century, Lyon became the capital of the European silk trade. Thousands of workers the canoes devoted themselves to the flourishing industry. In the middle of the 17th century, over 14,000 looms were used in Lyon, and the silk industry fed a third of the city's population. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Provence experienced a boom in sericulture that would last until World War I, with much of the silk shipped north to Lyon. England under Henry IV from 1367 to 1413 also looked to develop a silk industry, but there was no opportunity until the revocation of the Edict 
called Nantes in the 1680s. French Huguenots, many of whom were skilled weavers and experts in sericulture, began immigrating to England to escape religious persecution. Some areas, including Spetterfields, saw many high-quality silk workshops spring up, their products distinct from continental silk, largely by the colors they used. Nonetheless, the British climate prevented England's domestic silk trade from becoming globally dominant. Many envisioned starting a silk industry in the British colonies in America, starting in 1619 under the reign of King James I of England. However, the silk industry in the colonies never became very large. Likewise, silk was introduced to numerous other countries including Mexico, where it was brought by Cortes in 1522. Only rarely did these silk industries grow to any significant size. The start of the Industrial Revolution was marked by massive boom in the textile industry in general, with remarkable technological innovations made, led by the cotton industry of Great Britain. In its early years, there were often disparities in the technological innovation between different stages of fabric manufacture which encouraged complementary innovations. For example, spinning progressed much more rapidly than weaving. In the 17th and 18th centuries, progress began to be made in the simplification and standardization of silk manufacture, with many advances following one after another. Bouchon and Falcon's punch card loom appeared in 1775, later improved on by Jacques de Vaucance. Later, Joseph Marie Jacquard improved on the designs of Falcon and Vacanza, introducing the revolutionary Jacquard loom. The punch cards of the Jacquard loom were a direct precursor to the modern computer, in that they give a limited form of programmability. The loom was declared as public property in 1806 and Jacquard was rewarded with a pension and a royalty on each machine. In 1834, there were a total of 2,885 Jacquard looms in Lyon alone. The Canute Revolt in 1831 foreshadowed many of the larger worker offsprings of the Industrial Revolution. The Canutes occupied the city of Lyon, refusing to relinquish it until a bloody repression by the army led by Marshal Soult. A second revolt similar to the first took place in 1834. Following the crisis in Europe, the modernization of sericulture in Japan made it the world's most foremost silk producer. By the early 20th century, Rapidly industrializing Japan was producing as much as 60% of the world's raw silk, most exports shipping through the port of Yokohama. Italy managed to rebound from the crisis, but France was unable. Urbanization in Europe saw many French and Italian agricultural workers leave silk growing for more lucrative factory work. Raw silk was imported from Japan to fill the void. Asian countries, formerly exporters of raw materials, by that I mean cocoons and raw silk, progressively began to export more and more finished garments. During the Second World War, silk supplies from Japan were cut off, so Western countries were forced to find substitutes. Synthetic fibers such as nylon were used in products such as parachutes and stockings, replacing silk. Even after the war, silk was not able to regain many of the markets lost, 
though it remained an expensive luxury product. The continued rise in importance of synthetic fibers and loosening of the protectionist economy contributed to the decline of Japan's silk industry and by 1975 it was no longer a net exporter of silk. With its recent economic reforms, the People's Republic of China has become the world's largest silk producer. In 1996, it produced 58,000 tons out of a world production of 81,000, followed by India at 13,000 tons. Japanese production is now marginal at only 2,500 tons. Between 1995 and 1997, Chinese silk production went down 40% in an effort to raise prices reminiscent of earlier shortages. In December 2006, the General Assembly of the United Nations proclaimed 2009 to be the International Year of Natural Fibers so as to raise the profile of silk and other natural fibers. This is where we draw the curtain on the concluding part of the history of silk on Centurions. Do subscribe, like and share. My name is Dimitri and I'm saying thank you for watching and bye for now.